I did. What's going on, world? Jack of all space, CLT, back like we need a re up. I am the beloved one, DJ Spellman. On my left, we have the pride of Africa, Ken Wabibi. It's the pride of Africa, Ken Wabibi. Shout out Zimbabwe. Into the diaspora. Shout out Zimbabwe. You know how we do. Mm-hmm. Send it off on the right. We have the boy, Banks on the Beat. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Banks on the Beat, Blue Water Banks, Fat Boy Tires. 3700. Oh, the hub. There it is. We got it, right? <laughs> Hold tight. Jay Marlowe, a.k.a. Local 6, but we still got Carla running the camera, so we appreciate you, sis. But today, our special guest wants you to know she is a human first. Mm-hmm. She is a lover of words and a part-time Netflix movie critic. <laughs> we have Alicia Tete. What's going on, madam? Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> what's the laughing for? I mean, we've this, seen it. Let me tell you what's so funny. My um, my best friend's husband, he was like talking to me. He's my drum instructor. I'm taking drum lessons. Okay. And he's like, um, yeah, you got all this time when you ain't watching on Netflix. I'm probably the, I watch TV the least out of anybody. <laughs> but because you post about it, people are like, yeah, yeah you be watching that Netflix. I'm like, <laughs> that's funny. Perception. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad that you're here and you made time because we definitely want to get into all the great stuff that you're you're doing. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. Now I'm gonna start this off with our flower segment. So if this is your first time listening, first time watching, uh, this is how we start this off. So for you, Alicia, went from a Ram of VCU to a Bison of Howard. Mm-hmm. Now working on a doctorate at Simmons University. Member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, licensed clinical social worker, mother, change agent, poet, registered yoga teacher, I'm gonna need that, uh, <laughs> consultant, YBB2, um, <laughs> podcaster, two elephants in the room, mm-hmm. author, not healed as fuck in fingerprints of my soul, professor, entrepreneur, founder of Building Endurance PLLC and Attune, Charlotte Black Chamber of Commerce, 30 Under 30 in 2017. Also featured Charlotte Podcast Festival, BlackNews.com, Good Day Charlotte, Balanced Black Girl and Girl Boss Panelists. Damn, Y'all did lot. some y'all did research. <laughs> I pick up Joe Goldberg. Joe Goldberg. Okay, okay. Yeah, talk to us about That's this background. That's impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> My friend told me, he was like, yeah, they do their research. Oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I'm really impressed. So, <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say. You said all the things. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. I I definitely, um, yeah, I identify as a human first and a change agent. Um, I really believe that we all have the ability to be different um, and that we shouldn't be held to our past mistakes, mm. for sure. Um, and I really enjoy um, watching people evolve and change and grow. I think that's super important. Um, and I love to see the spark go off. So whether that's if you're my client on the couch or if you're my student or when a yoga class and you go deeper into a pose. So I really enjoy seeing people um, recognize their own growth. It's really important to me. Mm. Okay. Well, let's get into this thing. Now, the black delegation, mm-hmm. as most people say, has an issue with you. Mm-hmm. One of your IG posts says it's okay to have Jesus and a therapist, too. Mm-hmm. Can you speak on that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, God created all of us, I think, mm-hmm. um, to include therapists. Mm-hmm. And so, I have, um, my, my life's work is to really decrease the stigma around mental health. There's a huge stigma, um, and I think since, so I moved to North Carolina from L.A., and before L.A., I lived in New York, and before New York, I lived in D.C., and in all of those areas, like me being a therapist was common. Everybody had a therapist. It wasn't a big deal, but then when I came here, mm. I either get two reactions, like, oh, slowly walks away, <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, can I get your car so I can give it to my sister? Mm. Or my cousin or my mom, a.k.a. myself. So, um, 
Yeah, I've just really been trying to encourage folks to think about we all need different things Mm -hmm. um, in order to heal, in order to be well. Um, And there's not this idea that like one is greater than the other or you have to just have one thing. I feel like we're complex as humans and it's really important for us to know like this is what I need for me and for my own betterment. Um, Another thing, because I do work with and know a lot of creatives. Um, my ex is a music artist, so I'm very familiar with like the creative scene in Charlotte. And I think even amongst creatives and just people in general, if people have been suffering, they feel like they should just live in that mm. forever. Um, so there, I meet folks who have been sad for a very long time, or they've always been moody, or you know they've had a very traumatic experience due to their childhood. And they just feel like, well, that's what it's been, so I have to live in this forever. Mm. And so really trying to encourage folks to think about you don't have to be your past, um, and you can work through things. And even if you've done bad things, that doesn't mean that you can't live a good life. I I got a question, though. Mm -hmm. What made you choose this profession? Mm -hmm. So originally, uh, so I was raised mostly by my grandmother first. My mother was in the military um, and left her home due to a lot of trauma. Um, She left at 17. And so my grandmother only finished high school. She always wanted to be a nurse. So initially I got into nursing school. I didn't know anything about college. I was a first generation um, college student. And I went into nursing school because that's what she wanted. So I was working at a hospital, working at a bank in school. I've always had a lot of jobs. Um, And I noticed one day on the floor, there was this lady. She was dressed very smartly. Like all the clients really were um, gravitating towards her. And on my break, I was like, so what do you do? She's like, oh, I'm the social worker. I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know what that was. Mm. Um, I had never heard that term. And so... I had a mentor who was going to get his master's in social work and I was like talking to him and I wasn't doing well in one of my nursing classes. And um, I I decided to take an intro to social work class and really fell in love with the idea of um, holistically working on a person versus it feels very band-aid-ish as a nurse. Mm. Um, And so that's how I changed my career. And then when when I finished at VCU, my writing was poor. Uh, One of my professors was like, you need to go to grad school. And I was like, okay, nobody in my family has ever went. I'm not really sure, like, what that means. I knew I had gotten into Howard undergrad, but um, I didn't have the money. And so I got in again at the graduate level. So I was like, okay, cool. So I'll go to Howard and perfect my writing. Um, So I was studying at Howard, got my first opportunity to study abroad. We went to Haiti um, to do mission work and then... We went to South Africa to do mission work as well. And while I was there on the trip to South Africa, I was telling my professor, who is now my mentor, I was like, yeah, I think something is wrong with me. And her and my other professor were just kind of laughing. I was like, yeah, I kind of like know things. I was like, I know this sounds funny, but like, I just know things. Like I can walk in the room, I can read the room. And they're just like laughing. And I was like, why are y'all laughing at me? Like, I think something is wrong with me. And they were like, yeah, I need you to look up like the word discernment. I need you to look this word up. And I was like, okay, never heard of that. Um, But even in the midst of that, I was like, when I finish this degree, I'm going to go into substance use to help folks because there are substance issues in my family. I was like, who the hell wants to be a therapist and listen to people complain all day? I would never want to do that. Um, And then I look up that word discernment. My next internship, I was um, practicing as a therapist, and then it's been that way now for 10 years. Mm, big wow. up. Mm. Okay. Now, shout out to you for starting your own private practice. Um, mm-hmm. And letting our listeners on being an entrepreneur in that mental health space. Mm-hmm. It's rough. Um, everybody wants to be the boss, and so they have to clean their own toilets. Mm. Um, yeah. Say that. <laughs> and it's it looks very glamorous, but it's it's a lot of liability. Um, when I did first come to North Carolina, I was working for agencies um, as a team lead, and then I was a trainer. And there was like kind of some unethical things happening in the agency, and I was like, oh, I feel like I can kind of do this myself, and I also want to create a space where other um, black and brown folks can see a black woman in charge. And so that's really what prompted me to start an agency. 
Um, and then because, like I said, I really enjoy teaching, I started having interns and I've kind of like grown where I operate a teaching practice. So folks come, they know that you'll either see a licensed clinician or you may see what I have coined therapist in training. Okay. And so graduate level interns come to my practice and they can do their internship, their practicum. They learn how to be a therapist, how to run a business and all of that jazz. So OK, um, let me also ask, because, yeah. you know, working in the space that you work in and being an entrepreneur, like as far as your own mental health, how do you mm -hmm. take care of that? Because I'm mm -hmm. sure that's yeah. the thing you have to you know, come across all the time. Yeah. So I definitely um, I do go to church. I work out a lot, like probably three to four days a week. Um, I like to party. I love. I love to have a good time with my friends. Um, I am a mother, so I do have a lot of fun with those kids. Um, traveling, I travel. So yeah, I try to keep a pretty balanced life. Um, I work extremely hard. I'm definitely a workaholic. Workaholic, but I also like party. <laughs> and, that work -life and, balance. and rest just as hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. So uh, I've noticed listeners and the viewers on the YouTube can see the shirt. It says mm -hmm. somebody's therapist. Mm -hmm. Now going back to Banks' question. Yeah. Do you also engage oh, in therapy? Oh yeah. I forgot to answer that. <laughs> yeah, I have a great therapist, Dr. Sharice Johnson. She's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I during rougher times, I'll go weekly or bi-weekly. Right uh -huh. now, I'm just kind of in like a maintenance state, like not too much is going on, so I see her once a month. Um, but then I'm also still in my own supervision. So yeah. I'm a trauma therapist in Charlotte, which means like let's say a school shooting happens or like a robbery at a bank or something, I'll get called to come in and kind of like de-escalate and help the staff. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that, but where were you going with that? I don't know. But <laughs> yes, I do go to therapy. So I, I got a follow-up question go to that. Um, so as a therapist, mm -hmm. like, what are your thoughts on going to therapy? Like, do you look at your therapist like, oh, I don't know if that's the right way you should have handled it? Like, do you have yeah. that internal dialogue? Yeah, nah, I'd just be so happy to be able to talk myself. Gotcha. And so I don't, I don't think about that at all. I just go in and really let it all out. Um, I'm also known in the mental health space as the therapist who sees therapists. So a lot of my clients are therapists as well. Mm, wow. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, but I don't, I, and I've had other therapists here. Like I've had a great couples therapist, shout out to Lyle Williams. Um, I, I saw another individual th uh, therapist, Alma, who's also from Ghana. So yeah. All right. Okay. You was going to say something? No, no. Nah, nah, okay. Got it. You got cool. It. Cool. So. I have a mental health background. I started out doing mental health. Mm -hmm. So some of these terms may be new to our listeners, but I know you know, mm -hmm. and we want you to break it down for them. So you talked about that stigma for you know black mental health. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think in our opinion, it comes from a general lack of knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So can you break down the DSM-5? Mm -hmm. And then can you really change that narrative to say how a diagnosis is not a sign of weakness? Yeah, absolutely. So the DSM-5 is like the the Bible or the manual for mental health is how um, th the insurance company understands what to pay for with your service. So without mm. a diagnosis, the insurance company says, well, th why do I need to pay for this? Um, so basically when a client comes in initially, we always do an intake assessment. We gather information, we learn your story. We try to match up that criteria to something in the DSM. And then that's your diagnosis. What I always tell my clients, though, is you are not your diagnosis. This is just really something for me so that I know where to start. And so so that I'm, like, not in the trauma area, but when you really have depression or I'm yeah. not in the anxiety area when it's really conduct. And so really the DSM, which stands for Diagnostical Statistical Manual, um, we're on the fifth version. It's just a dictionary that has, like, this equals this. Hmm. So... We use the DSM-5 in the United States. Outside of the United States, they use the ICD-10 system. Um, they don't use the DSM-5 outside of the U.S., um, but it is still like that same uh, system. It's comparable, though, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's just there's an international version versus a United States version. And then some of my clinicians that are listening, because I know some folks believe, um, well, I take cash, and I don't need to give a diagnosis. And I just want to remind people, you know, we're held to a standard ethically, 
And if you get audited or one of the things that happened to me, um, cause I've had my practice either six or seven years now, I can't remember, sorry. But early on when I didn't have the systems that I have now, I had a client come back to me like three years later and she wanted her documents and I couldn't produce them. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that even because I don't believe that everybody needs medication or everybody needs a diagnosis or whatever, but that's different from my fidelity and commitment to the profession. And so even if you are cash, taking only cash, I suggest that you give everybody a diagnosis and a formal assessment so that if they transition to another clinician or they go to a psychiatrist, mm-hmm. they'll be able to have those records. That continuity of care. So exactly. message, message exactly. out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, I got a question mm-hmm. before I get into my other question. Mm-hmm. Um, so how often do they revise this uh, DSM? You That's say it's the fifth question. one, right? This is the fifth yeah. one. So the last, so they just came out with a revision. So technically it's fifth TR. Mm. Um, and the one before this, it's been like seven. I've, if I've been here since 2015. It's been seven or nine years, mm. and I've actually been looking at. I was talking to my professors about trying to get on the committee for mm. writing the DSM, okay. mm-hmm. um, because I'm sure it's written by white men. Um, just Most likely, looking, at, looking <laughs> at the language and how things are like. I'm almost certain. I could be wrong. But I'm sure it's majority white men and a couple of mm. minorities. But mm. um, yeah, I've been trying to look at getting on the committee because it's a voluntary committee that's put together of professionals. Of course, you're interviewed and all that jazz, but um, it happens ever so often, but it's still not, it doesn't happen as quick as life happens, right? Mm. So we know, let's use the pandemic, for example. Um, in my doctorate program, I'm researching like the impact of the pandemic on clinicians, um, but we're nowhere near like categorizing that in the DSM. Mm. But we are closer to categorizing like internet addiction. Right. Right. Something that's been happening, but we're a little closer to Mm -hmm. that. Um, We probably won't see like COVID in the DSM probably for another five years, Mm -hmm. just because it takes a minute for research to catch up to what's happening. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hmm. Now you said where people put their time is where it really matters to them. Yeah. Um, Why do you think most folks neglect their mental health? That's a good question. Um, Part of it has to do with we, so all of our values came from whoever raised us mm. Yes. Um, initially, because that's just the way that things work. And so if you come from a family that doesn't believe in mental health, for example, and then you become a young adult and you start having issues, you're going to be either afraid to tell your family or you're not going to um, try to do anything about it because that's mm. not what you've been taught. Mm-hmm. It's the same premise around racism and all the other isms. So... When we leave from our home, whether we work or go to college, we're confronted with new ideas. And you get to decide, I'm going to take in this new idea and delete some of the old ideas or replace or make the two ideas work. Um, And so if you come from a family, like my family, for example, even to this day, they're like, you're a what? (laughs) Um, But if you come from a family that, like, that's not been their norm, it's not your norm. Um, and then every day we all get to make a choice about what we believe and what we what we value. Gotcha, gotcha. I could I could resonate with that because you know I'm Congolese, mm-hmm. and so you know growing up, mental health wasn't the big conversation in our in our family. It's right. like if something's going on mentally, it's evil spirits. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> yeah. we're gonna pray it out of you. We're gonna call yeah. the shaman to come in and you know put hands on you, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's not really like hey something's mentally wrong, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So I understand what you're saying with that. Mm-hmm. And I, I've been trying to you know, break that cycle. Like I have a son, and mm-hmm. so you know. Well, you know, God forbid if something happens in, with his mental history, you right. know what I'm saying, right. that we actually go and see a therapist. We see that, you know, try to get some actual, like, people to come in and, and solve the issue, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Just mm-hmm. try to break that cycle. Absolutely. But, yeah. And, you know, going back to my earlier point, mm-hmm. like, North Carolina is still technically the Bible Belt. And so, technically, a lot of folks still believe, like, you should be taking us to the church. Mm-hmm. When I first got here and I was, like, going to different churches, I would go to the pastors and like, are you a counselor, a licensed counselor, or are you just a pastor? And they would be looking at me. Um, (laughs) Because people go to their pastors for that. So I always encourage, like, if you're going to do that work, then you need to get licensed in that way. If you're not, then be okay with talking about mental health in the church because that is the norm of where folks go to get problems resolved. Or they go to their primary care doctor, um, which is okay too, but just... 
understanding that there are a lot of areas you can go to to get help. Um, but if my tooth is broken, like I'm not going to the orthopedic doctor. Exactly. Right. You know, and so that's why I kind of try to differ- differentiate for people. Like there are specific people for with specialties, even though, even for example, a primary care doctor versus a psychiatrist, they're both medical doctors. They both have their MD, but a psychiatrist has further education specifically in mental health. And so I would encourage my clients, even if your primary care doctor gave you antidepressants, that's great. You need to be followed up with somebody who is a psychiatrist or MP or a PA who has a mental health certification. Message. 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 Um, With a lot of generational trauma of our people Mm -hmm. that we faced, um, do you feel added pressure being a black therapist? That's a good question. Pressure is not the word, but I do definitely feel a sense of responsibility. Hmm. So you mentioned the Attune app, which I created a few years back. And I remember when I was creating it, working with the investors, and they were like, oh, you got to make your social media public. And I was like, ooh, I don't really want to do that. (laughs) Um, um, Because once we, and I think this just goes back to like how we learn. Um, As children, we learn by categorizing things. So these shapes go together, these colors, these numbers. We do that as adults, too. It just turns into a bias, right? Mm. Um, So sometimes when we learn somebody's role, we change our opinion of the standard we hold them to. Mm. And so just like when an athlete does something, you know, there are some people like, I'm never watching them because they're, and then there are other people like, well, that's different from their athletic abilities. Mm -hmm. Um, The same holds true for me. So the expectation is because I teach people how to communicate, I'm the best communicator. Or because I am a therapist, I I don't curse, or I don't have a nose (laughs) ring, or have tattoos, or all these things. Um, And so pressure is not the word, but definitely responsibility. As a business Mm -hmm. owner, um, as a mother, there's not many places in Charlotte I go where somebody doesn't know my name. Mm -hmm. And not on a, I'm a big, not from that perspective, but they've been in a training with me, or they, they, they have some how connected with me and so I have to be mindful that my authentic self is I'm, I'm the same in every space gotcha. so even if you all heard me here if you came and sat in my classroom if you were my client I'm showing up this way I don't present one way in one space and another way in another space you just sparked something to me when you talked about being on the committee that works on the DSM-5 and how it's not culturally relevant mm-hmm. to the clientele most of the clientele that you're you're working with so you and the cl- clinicians that are under you how do you take you know this highbrow concepts mm-hmm. and make it culturally relevant to your clients that's a good question mm-hmm. um the three values that i run my practice underneath is authenticity genuineness and being competent um so everybody that i bring in there's no dress code at the practice Mm. You know, you can kind of wear whatever. If we're going out to do something like a critical incident, we may dress up. But I really encourage folks to just really be themselves because clients can see when you're pretending. Mm. Um, Also, when you're trying to, like, be somebody else, um, it just doesn't always really resonate. And so for new interns, of course, they're trying to do everything I do or trying to please me. And I'm like, but I'm not your client. And so I want you to find your own voice and Mm. be that because it's super important. But also when we are authentic, then that gives the clients the space to be vulnerable mm-hmm. and they don't feel like they have to come in there and pretend um, because everybody's fear is being judged. None of, none exactly. of us want to be judged. Yeah. None of us want to be slandered, right? And so really just encouraging at my practice in particular, like we're going to show up authentic, um, professional, but authentic. Okay. All right. I want to transition. Um, you had an IG post uh, March 8th, 2022. Um, you had not too much. You talk about being able to show up as your full self in, mm-hmm. a, health, in a healthy relationship. Yeah. Speak on that for us. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure my ex-husband can give you all the stories about being <laughs> married to a therapist. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I've had to overcome some of my own insecurities around being too much, doing too much, and all the degrees and the titles and the this and the that. People will make you feel like... Um, you have to be less than to like mm. fit in. Um, and so I've worked really hard at coming to a place of like, I'm okay with who I am. And if it's too much, that's okay too. Mm. Um, but I really had to learn that because I've been aggressive the majority of my life. I was a fighter, very rude, cussing, you know, very different from who I am today. Um, and still charismatic, still a leader. And I had to realize like, it's okay to kind of like soften a little bit around the edges, um, but you also are not gonna be for everybody. 
And so mm-hmm. I don't take it personally if a client is not a good fit or if a student is like, I'm not their favorite professor or, you know, whatever it is, because I'm, I'm not for everybody. Yeah. Um, but the folks that I'm for, I'm for them. Um, and I'm going to work with them and I'm going to meet them um, 250%. Um, but again, there was just a time in my life where I really felt like I had to be something or I had to be this whatever to fit whatever. And I just, I don't believe that anymore. Hmm. I have a question before I get to my next question. Mm-hmm. So when folks are... Y'all have a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot of sparks. Like you yeah. spark stuff in and out. Right. Um, <laughs> so when folks are you know, looking for a therapist, mm-hmm. are there any key questions people should be asking the therapist to make sure they're the right fit for them? Absolutely. Absolutely. We live in the wonderful world of Google. I mm. tell people you should definitely Google folks. Um, you should look at their reviews. You should look at their website. Um, and then you need to decide what's important to you. So before a client comes to um, be a client of ours, yep. uh, we do free consultations over the phone. And so there are set questions that I have my staff ask folks so that we can pair them with the best clinician. Um, so it's okay to have a preference, a gender preference, a race preference, Um some people are like, you know, I want a more experienced clinician, so somebody who's been practicing for five years or ten years or whatever. Um, society sometimes will make us feel like we can't have preferences, like, oh, I can't ask for that. That's the wrong thing. But if you're not comfortable, you're not going to be able to do any work. Exactly. And so why sit across from somebody that you're not comfortable with? That, that doesn't make sense to me. There's a, mm. I know you all, it may not seem to you, but there are hundreds of us. There are a lot of therapists. And we all have different styles and we all bring different things to the table. So for folks listening, you can ask for a specific gender. You can ask for a specific specialty. um, You can ask for an age range, like all of those things, whatever matters specifically to you. When I lived in New York, I had an older white female therapist. I mean, she was cool. You know, she helped me work through some daddy issues, but she wouldn't be my first preference. But at the time, I didn't realize there were other therapists that looked like me. Mm -hmm. Because the majority of when I looked it up was older white women. So I was like, cool. Um, I've had male therapists before. I've had um, different... um, like cultural backgrounds, like so when when me and my ex went, I was really trying to find somebody from Ghana so that he could be connected. So you can find what you're looking for. Um, and my friend said it's kind of like speed dating because sometimes <laughs> you, you go through a few. Um, but when you do find that person, like I think you'll know because you'll be comfortable, you'll be able to be vulnerable, and mm. you'll feel different. Got you, got you. Um, we kind of spoke on this a little bit briefly as far as like therapists seeing therapists. Mm-hmm. Um, now, should folks be weary of therapists who don't see a therapist? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now you're asking my personal opinion. <laughs> my personal opinion is, yes, I okay. am a huge, I am a very big champion that in order for therapists to take care of people, we have to take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see that. Um, and if you look at the research, the people who take care of themselves the least are the helpers. Mm-hmm. So it's the doctors that don't go to the doctor, the dentist with all the cavities, mm-hmm. the nurse with the smoking mm-hmm. problem. It's very interesting if you if you all have some time to read up on it. Um, and so what I know to be true is there are new therapists and more seasoned therapists who've never been, um, because some people feel like they can heal by proxy. So Mm. if I make all of these people, well, I'm going to be well. And I'm like, it doesn't work that way. And so I'm not everybody's favorite supervisor because I do challenge therapists to do their own work. Um, and to me, you are not a competent therapist if you've not been a therapy. And that's just my personal opinion. Um, so message yeah, right, right. <laughs> well i'm going to something else a little transition here okay so you talked about cool. south africa before haiti mm-hmm. before um some of the dishes in haiti and south africa that you like what are some of the dishes mm. i'm not gonna get this answer right. <laughs> <laughs> and how long were you there right at all so i went to haiti for two weeks two weeks okay um and we had a lot of fish from what i can remember a lot of fresh fish Hmm. all the food was fresh actually um but when i was in south africa the first time i was in a hostel we kind of ate like at restaurants um and then the second time is when we had like more home cooked meals um but i do not have a specific dish but i will say that i love to eat Hey, we live in the same boat. I, I, love, I love to eat. I like to cook. Um, and I like to try new foods. Mm, okay. For sure. 
All right, so we know you a big proponent of being outside, you know, getting oh, that, yes, yes, getting yes, that yes, vitamin D. I Talk about how, that. you know, vitamin D increases, cr- increases the mood. Mm-hmm. So what would you say are your favorite places? And this could be anywhere in the world, places mm-hmm. you've been to kind of soak it all in. Mm. So recently I went to Belize. Okay. And it was. Shout out, Sean. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's moved up to my top. Tulum and Belize and South Africa are like my top three places for sure i went to aspen this past weekend that was cool nice. that was different we were the only black people there and i was yeah it quite the contrast it was it was a lot happening in aspen whole whole lot of things happening but i'm getting ready, i'm getting, getting ready to take my team to tanzania and kenya though oh, in, no. um, in a few months in june so this will be our first time like doing a service learning trip. So I'm going to take some interns, some of my therapists, um, and we're going to study global social work. So we're going to work at a clinic there. We're going to visit the Social Work Institute, and we're going to have some fun. Mm, um, okay. So I'm the only one in the group that's been to Africa. Out of those of us that's going, a lot of them have never even left the country. Mm. So I'm a little anxious, like, you better take a big group out of the country, but... Um, I'm definitely looking forward to that. How does one even get that opportunity to do that for their team? Uh, initiative? I don't know. <laughs> one of my, one of my, yeah. you know, one of my interns was like, you know what, we should, we should do a service learning trip. I was like, cool. I have a friend that I used to work with who is from Tanzania. He is um, the male definition of a nun, so he's like okay. in brotherhood. I feel like I should call him a monk, but he doesn't go by that, so. Um, yeah, but he he is an RN by trade, but he goes in different places over the world talking about Jesus and then also working as an RN. And so he and I used to work together when I was at Howard, and over the years we've always kept in touch. And yeah. he's like, you should come to Tanzania. And finally, my intern said that. I was like, let me just email my friends. So he's like, y'all can stay here. Y'all can work at our clinic. Um, I'm raising money now because I want to cover the whole trip. I don't know how close I am to that, but I'm definitely covering everybody's housing. Um, and getting paying for visas and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, the supervisor mm-hmm. right there, right? <laughs> oh, hold on a second. I gotta say this. If I, if I don't say this, my wife's gonna kill me. Okay. So I got back to your Aspen uh, oh, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went to Denver. We had that same experience in Denver. I, <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I, it was different. It was, and now I really enjoyed it. The air was yeah. good. But mm-hmm. did you notice? So one of my Neos is on the trip, yeah. and her um. Her breathing was off or something, so mm-hmm. she got the spray yeah. oxygen, uh-huh. the oxygen spray, and she just kept like spraying. But I noticed like, and I'm pretty fit, but like I was going up and down the stairs in the house, the yeah. Airbnb. I was like, why am I so out of breath? But the altitude, the yeah. altitude, crazy. Yeah, we went skiing. I did it twice and I was done. Yeah, I couldn't do it no more. I had yeah. to sit down. I couldn't breathe. You couldn't breathe. <laughs> yeah. That's how it was when we were on the ski lift. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, this is different. But my birthday's in January, okay. and I've been saying I want a cold birthday. So I think next year I'm gonna go back Dope. to Denver for my birthday. I think. Yeah. I mean, I believe um, some people have a condition because I know there were some NFL players when they play in my high, they couldn't yeah. go really? because of the altitude. The altitude. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. It there is a condition. Yeah. yeah. It's altitude something something because we kept calling it the curse word. But it's not the curse word. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the other two words, but it starts with altitude. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Alicia, we've reached the most popular segment of Jack of All Spades Nation. Oh, we boy. call it Top Five Dead or Top Alive. So shout alive. out Jada and the Locks. Mm-hmm. So if people don't know, you are a strength based therapist, right? Uh huh. Uh-huh. So what are your top five strengths that have helped you just? matriculate through this life oh okay this is easy i thought you were gonna ask me my top five people that are alive i was like oh god oh. pressure um okay That's next episode okay perfect i was like i don't have the answer um definitely grace resilience endurance um the ability to apologize and the ability to rest can we get a little bit of elaboration madam mm. absolutely um so should have wrote this down. Like, what, did I, what did I say? Look, this is your introduction to Jack of All Space Nation, so we want them to really know Grace, who you are. Resilience, uh, rest, rest, mm-hmm. and apologizing. apologizing. All right, cool. So I was, I was an, I was an arrogant something, something for the majority of my life. Um, my line sisters will tell about how when we was online and we got an assignment and I took off because um, I didn't know how to work on a team at the time. Mm. Um, but I have learned 
over the years, the importance as a leader, just as somebody in relationship with others to be able to apologize. Um, and coming from a space of when you are in a relationship with somebody, whether it's professional or intimate or even platonic, we all play a role. Um, and I've definitely had some very hard lessons that taught me, like, you have to be able to own up to your... Can I curse? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. You have to be able to own up to your shit and apologize. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can really change the trajectory of relationships in your life. So that's that one. Um, Grace, yeah, we're super hard on ourselves. We're very critical. We can, I, I start all my sessions off the same. I know if my clients have a group chat about me, they like talk shit. Because I start every <laughs> session with, tell me three things you're grateful for, three things you, um, three good things since I've seen you the last time. And everybody really struggles with that. But I think it's because a lot of us are just so critical and mm. we sit in this space of what's wrong with me and what I don't have and so on and so forth. And so I'm always on this mission to encourage us to be extending grace to ourselves, mm. especially because we're very nice to other people. Mm. Like I'm very That's nice true. to my children, my right. friends, my family. Like I only want to give them kind words, but like we need to be able to give ourselves that. So mm, that's the sure. second one. Um, resilience. Yeah. Every time... So I've had some different traumas in my life. Um, and I feel like with every lesson in my head, like I gain new armor. Mm. And so the next time I have some battle of sorts, um, physical or mental or whatever, like I feel like I'm a bit stronger. And so just coming f from this idea of like every lesson, every loss is a lesson, mm. you know, and we get stronger every time, even if we get defeated we get stronger to like fight a different battle. Um, and then endurance. So the name of my private practice is Building Endurance. When I was in grad school at Howard, I that's the first time I went to therapy because one of my classes, we all had to go. And it was the first time I got a name for what I had going on, like sweaty palms, like thoughts racing, couldn't sleep, stomach hurting, it's called anxiety. Um, and I started running with Black Girls Run. Um, and then I started like running races, 5Ks, 10Ks. I ran a couple marathons, a couple half marathons, um, and really sat with this idea of like my the tagline is life is a marathon. We should fi finish together. But sometimes we need help along the way mm -hmm. in order to endure, right? So sometimes we may need a therapist or a nurse or water if it's a race or the chocolate bar or you may need to release so you may need to use the bathroom to get the eight the last eight miles in so um this idea that we can all endure but sometimes it just takes a little bit of support yeah um and then rest yeah so we live in the grind culture um definitely I, I definitely was a part of that culture i've never had a corporate job it's just not for me but um when i go and teach at corporate jobs like it is very much like you got to be here at this time and mm -hmm. you tie and shit and i'm like this is a lot <laughs> it's a lot um and my clients who are like lawyers and have like fast-paced jobs i mean they are miserable now they make a lot of money but very miserable um so i'm really trying to send out this message about like we need to be resting as much as we labor um and that it's okay to just labor like okay to rest you don't have to okay i can't rest until i've hit this mark and hit that mark there's always going to be a new mark um and so really just enforcing this idea that if i rest um intentionally and often then i won't get burnt out we're mm. burnt out because we don't rest um, we're burnt out because at some point our body is like i can't take it anymore and then it just shuts down and we're like i don't know what's happening <laughs> it's like you haven't <laughs> Your body is tired. Your brain is tired. And so really trying to get folks in this space of like, I don't have to grind. I don't have to meet these deadlines of marry by this and kids by that, blah, blah, blah. Like, I really can just intentionally rest. Mm. Yeah, rest things I got to work on. I got to work on that yeah. rest. <laughs> yeah. Every time I go to therapy, like, that is my... She's like, okay, well, tell me how you rested or did you take on new projects? Because I'm a new project girl. <laughs> um, so whenever, you know, I, I nap in between clients. My clients be like, what are you doing? Just taking a little nap. Uh, <laughs> I'll go on a walk <laughs> um, just so I can, like, calm my mind down. Hmm. Yeah. So with that going on the walk, we talked about your places, you know, all around. Yeah. But what about here in Charlotte, those places you like to get out to and, yeah. and be out in the sun? Absolutely. So the Greenway, I love. Um, I saw Ken at Mad Miles. Yes, I really, did. I really enjoy Mad Miles. <laughs> we gotta go. 
Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Tuesdays, I'll be having class, and it'd be so many people. Saturdays, <laughs> Saturday's a good day. I like Saturdays. <laughs> um, I'm a big hiker. Actually, tonight, I'm going to take the kids on a sunset hike. Um, nice. So we'll do that at Crowder's. Um, where else? My deck. I have a beautiful deck right down the block, a little fire pit. Um, but yeah, I like being outside. I, my grandmother has Alzheimer's and I'm her caregiver. Mm. And so she lives with me, um, most of the time. And so when she's here, like even getting her out to do walk or, um, I'll do yoga in the park with folks. Um, so I do like Freedom Park. Mm. I like Freedom a lot. And then my office is in, in university and there is a... Greenway up there by elementary school. I just cannot think of the name. But it's like four miles. It's very nice. And so when I'm preparing for a race or something, I'll run over there. Okay. So Jack of All Spades Nation, you've heard the word. So changing that narrative around mental health, mm -hmm. you don't have to go it alone like you talked about in that marathon. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we all need help. Yep. Like, let's, let's put that to rest. Mm -hmm. All right. But as always, I am the beloved one. It's your boy YBB. Shout out Zimbabwe. Shout out Zimbabwe. Yeah, Banks, Blue Water, Fat Boy Tires. I already know. All right, so Miss Alicia, what are the parting words? Well, first off, where can people find you? Yes. Socials. Sure, right. Shout out mm -hmm. all that. So hopefully somebody that's listening will tap in because they need that help. Absolutely. Building Endurance PLLC and Two Elephants in the Room is me and another therapist. We have a podcast where we talk about mental health and in black spaces um and yeah i mean you can follow my personal instagram i have very conflicting <laughs> <laughs> conflicting <Disclaimer>. um <laughs> yeah for sure it's alicia octavia on instagram mm. it's all good now what are the parting words to jack of all space nation mm -hmm. mm, 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 mm. we were not meant to celebrate nor mo mourn alone and so life is beautiful and we should celebrate that with folks and life is also sad sometimes and we also need to be in community with people then so just really understanding that we shouldn't be doing anything by ourselves mm. that's a full ball right there yeah for sure, for sure. all right so jack of all space nation you know where you can find us anchor.fm is the reason why you can find us on places like apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify Thank you once again, Carla, for the audio and the visuals, which can be found on YouTube. Mm -hmm. iHeartbreaker is the usual. But <laughs> you know how we close this thing out. One time for a tribe called Quest. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace, Fife Dog. Mm -hmm. Tell your mother, tell your father, send a telegram. We out. <laughs>